When you think about what Jesus went through, you meditate on that. You can't tell me that does not give you perspective. To look at your own life and say, what I'm going through is nothing. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Let me, let me, get, let, let me pull my socks up. Let me, let me just get stuff going. How's your church doing this morning? Some of you guys are a little bit dead, no sun out. I pray today's Bible study fires you up. Tell your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. On the 10th of May 1983, a man by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn received an award called the Templeton Prize. Alexander lived throughout the time of the wicked regime called the Soviet Union. What was it wicked? Well, there was what called the Great Purge, okay, the Great Terror, from 1936 to 1938. Stalin went about trying and executing those who stand opposed to what he believed. Estimated 1.2 million people were executed. In 1932 to 33, there was a man-made famine. Estimated 5 to 5.5 million deaths because of this famine. That was what was called the Gulag systems. Forced labor camps with high mortality due to starvation, disease, and harsh conditions. It was said at one time it peaked inmates at 2.5 million inmates. Estimated deaths, 1.7 million people. Within his acceptance speech, he says this. If I could summarize why all this wickedness happened, it's because men have forgotten God. Men have forgotten God. If there's a time for my sermon this morning, men have forgotten God. We live in a spiritual Soviet Union where Satan is claiming the lives of countless men and women. 71% of human trafficking victims are women and children. One in, one in three trafficked ch victims are children. 80 million pounds are generated through sexual exploitation of these children every year. 30% of internet traffic is pornographic. 2.5 billion people view porn every day. That's a million people every minute. 100 million people every hour. 28,000 people every second. 93% of boys, 62% of girls exposed to pornography before the age of 18. Tens of thousands of new images of child pornography is uploaded onto the internet every week. 15,000 offensive in London for knife crime in 2023. Keep in mind, these stats are only those that have been reported. The question comes, why has all this happened? Some cry fatherless homes. Others cry racism. But the true issue is, men have forgotten God. What happens when men forget God? They forget and they doubt God's word. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 27. Peter denies Jesus three times. And the Bible says he remembers the word of God after he sinned, not before. When you forget God, you forget his word. When you forget God, you doubt his word. When you forget God, you make it about your feelings, your experience, and your emotions. Have you forgotten God this morning? We're in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. The setting, just before the promised land. They were on the cusp of receiving God's promise for their lives. Moses preaches the law for a second time. Why was Deuteronomy needed? For 40 years, the people of God were wandering in the desert. And the first generation of people died. And the second generation of people were risen. 
The most repeated word in this run is remember. To recall, to call to mind, in order to affect a change for present feelings, thoughts, and actions. I've heard it once said, people forget because the object of which they've forgotten is not important to them. You know, sometimes as disciples, we get to our place where we forget why we've been, why we've been called and why we do what we do. It's sad, but it's true. We can become committed to commitment. Yeah. And some people say, hey, it's not bad to be committed to commitment. It's not, it's not bad to be committed to commitment. But when things become inconvenient, you no longer are committed to what God's called you to be committed to. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verse 9, it reads, Only be careful and watch yourself closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as you live. Teach them to your children and your children's children. Chapter 4, verse 23. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God, Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything for the Lord. Anything, any form of the Lord your God has forbidden. Chapter 6, verse 12. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. This is chapter 8. Point 1. I have a very quick sermon for you guys. A very quick sermon. Point one. When you forget, your salvation is under threat. When you forget, your salvation is under threat. You know, one of the saddest things about forgetting is that it can lead you to lose your salvation. I know you don't believe me, I'm going to read you guys scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Be careful to follow everything I command I'm giving you today, so you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land of the Lord, promise and oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what's in your hearts, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, caused you to hunger, and to feed you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but at every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes do not, work, do not wear out, and your feet do not swell during the 40 years. That's incredible. Yeah. Know that in your heart that as a man disciplines his sons so the Lord, your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranate, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will never be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks and iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills, where you have eaten and are satisfied. Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and these decrees that I'm giving you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build a, your house, find houses and settle down, and when your, uh, your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and you, all you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud. And you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, he led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that first and wet waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert. Something that your fathers had never known to humble you and to test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify to you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will not be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. 
Powerful chapter. When you forget, your salvation is under threat. Three signs you've forgotten God today. Sign one. As it says in verse 11, disobedience. Disobedience. Where have you been disobedient in your discipleship? You know, obedience, you don't need to feel to obey to obey. I think sometimes we make obedience a prerequisite for obedience. Ever been there before? When I feel like it, I will do it. Did you know the quickest way to erase doubt is obedience? Yes. Come on, babe. Come on. The reason we doubt is because we disobey the Bible. The quickest way to erase doubt is to obey. Do you know understanding is not a prerequisite for obedience? I'm going to wait until I understand it fully. Let me, let me make sure I get all the facts, all the stats, all the details. Then I'll do what God's called me to do. But I eradicate faith. Obedience does not require feeling. It doesn't require understanding. It only, you only need, only requirement is a clear command. If the Bible says make disciples and you do not, because you don't feel like it, you're in sin. It's because you've forgotten the Lord. A sign you've forgotten God is disobedient. Sign number two. Verse 12. Satisfaction. When you get satisfied with what you've done for God, when you get satisfied, I'm having great quiet times. I'm sharing my faith. I got five Bible studies. I baptized someone last week. We get satisfied for what you've, got, you've done for God. It's a sign you've forgotten God. The Bible says God desires all men to be saved. <laughs> One soul converted compared to eight billion is a drop in the sea of the depravity of this world. Jesus was never satisfied. Even on the cross. When he was down on the cross, he saved the thief on the cross. He was still focused on the mission. He was still focused on seeking the saving of the lost, even on the cross as he was dying. Are you satisfied with what you've done for God? I'm not. I'm not. This park should be filled with people that love God. Do you know how I know you love God? You didn't leave when it started to rain. You love God. But the question is, have you forgotten Him? In verse 14, it says pride is a sign that we've forgotten God. Idolization of self. Do you know how you idolize yourself? It's when you elevate your feelings, your emotions, your experience above God. If the Bible clearly says something, but you feel like it doesn't say it. Or have you ever, have you ever read a scripture and you said, oh man, I don't know if I want to believe that. Yeah. Anyone ever been there before? Yeah. I guess it's only me. I guess, I guess I'm just sitting here. But the Bible says it. And at that moment, I'm going to put faith in the God of the Bible. Who knows what I don't know. You understand there's things that I don't know that there's a reason why God's saying this. <laughs> and when I put faith in God, God moves. Have you forgotten God this morning? You know, the danger of forgetting God is he'll take you out. Take a moment, consider everyone who's fallen away. Consider those you know that's left God. He's fallen away. We no longer say you can find these signs in their lives. Where it's about self, there's a lot of disobedience, and they're satisfied with what they've done for God. God says he'll cut you off. That's what falling away is. It's not someone simply leaving or the signs to leave church. John 15 says God cuts people off. Because he wants to protect the vine. And so maybe those people that study the Bible don't become Christians. It's because God's protecting us. Maybe those who fall away weren't true brothers and sisters. God's protecting us. But a sign you've forgotten God is that you have a bad attitude at God because he cuts people off. John 6 says disciples fell away. You guys read that in the Bible? John 6? It says that Jesus preached a hardline message. He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Can you imagine that? 
I preach at the end, my, my final challenge is drink my blood and eat my flesh to go to the glory. They would be like, what? Jesus preached that with no explanation. Not at all. <laughs> and it says the disciples said, this is a hard teaching, you can accept it. And many of them fell away from him. They returned home, the Bible says. Why? Because Jesus was not their home. So they returned home and they fell away because they thought they were more moral than Jesus Christ. Have you forgotten God this morning? You know, I remember when I forgot God. About six years ago, I was living in Oxford. And I went to Oxford because I failed my degree here in London. How bad did you feel? No other university in London would take me. So I had to go to Oxford Brooks out in Oxford to study and finish my degree. And it was a glorious first four months. I had Bible talk every week. I had like five people, six people, 10 people, 15 people out to Bible talk at one time. Baptized a guy called Stephen White. And it was awesome. God was moving in a radical way. But then Stephen White forgets God and he falls away. And when he fell away, my faith fell away with him too. I remember going back to Sins. I, never, I said I'll never go back to pornography and masturbation. Every day. I remember for a week and a half, I did not leave my house. I was living in darkness, literally. Curtains closed, lights off, and it was just me, my sin, and the depravity of my thinking. I remember disciples trying calling me, but not responding to their calls. I remember Michael called me. He called me once. And I said, if I pick up this phone call, I'm going to get a rebuke. And so I didn't pick it up. Then he called a second time. And I said, if I pick up this phone call, or if I don't pick up this phone call, I made the decision to leave. This is my final lifeline. And so I picked it up. Then I got a rebuke. And then Michael went on to persuade me to remember God. To remember all that God had done in my life. How he saved me. Forgave me of all of my sins. Tell your Bible to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Do you know, throughout the Bible, God calls us to remember. The rainbow is a symbol for God to remember not to flood the world again. <laughs> hey, man. I won't worry for that. In the, in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, God calls us to remember the Passover, Right? In Luke uh, 22, 19, Jesus calls us to remember the, the communion, the bread and the wine. In Psalm 77, it says this. Powerful scripture. I'm coming. Oh, perfect. Thank you, sir. Round of applause for our cyber team. In Psalm 77, the Bible says this in verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the, of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Question, how often do you obey this? It says here, I will remember the deeds of God. I will consider all of your works and meditate. You know what it means to meditate? It takes a moment to muse over it. Like you think about the Israelites walking on dry ground through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. And you take a moment to think about that and place yourself in their shoes. What will we go through my mind in that moment? On my left, I see a whale. On my right, I see a shark. I see millions of people walking with me on dry ground. And it's not muddy. I look behind me and the Egyptians are coming. I walk a little bit faster. <laughs> but just meditating on the mighty things God has done. If you do that for 15 minutes and then you think about your deadline for education, you're like, this is nothing. When you think about fire coming down from heaven, when Elijah 
was fight, fighting and going off against the, the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah the first Kings 18. And how he's praying for God to turn the hearts of the people back unto him. And you put yourself in their shoes. That you think about your, your, your financial situation. You're going to like, God, if God could take fire from heaven to lick up a sacrifice in a famine, in a drought, God could get me a job like this. There's power in remembering. There's power in remembering. To remember is not a passive thing. It's quite active. It's quite intentional. It's something that we're called to do throughout scriptures. Look at Romans 12. Romans 12. You know, raise a sign of fruit. And so pray to be drenched. Point two. My second and final point. <laughs> Heed the call to remember Jesus. Heed the call to remember Jesus. In Romans 12, it says this in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper and true worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. They you be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, a perfect will. You know, the Bible says here, in view of God's mercy, the Greek for mercy is plural, so mercies. So in view of all the incredible mercies of God, Lamentations 3 said they're new every morning. In view of God's incredible mercies, there's a response to that. What is the response of, of, of seeing God every single day and the mercy and the way he's moved in your life? A sacrificial way of living. It's not that God is yanking your life out of your hands to put on the altar. You offer him. You offer him your life. He's a living sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice for him because he sacrificed so much for you. There's, there's this level of supernatural obedience you have. That, that obedience that goes beyond what's required. Because you understand God's mercy and your eyes are focused on Jesus. A fruit of remembering Jesus is renewed way of thinking. You don't longer think in a worldly way. Like something worldly may happen, but you don't respond to it in a worldly way. You're able to go through life and go through the world, go through your day and understand, okay, there's a reason why this thing is happening right now. And it's not for me to get mad or get bitter or, or to, to, to doubt God. It's, no, this is the reason for me to strengthen my faith. You're able to see God in every little thing going on in your life because your, your mind is re renewed by what you're seeing, which is Jesus. And then we find there's an ability to view your life as good, pleasing, and perfect. Can you say that right now? That my life is good, pleasing, perfect. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. But you have the ability to see it as good. This is good for me. Oh, this is pleasing in God's sight. And this is perfect for me right now. If you cannot say that, it's because your eyes are not on Jesus. You have not heeded the call to remember Jesus. But most importantly, what I love about this passage, it teaches gratitude. It's gratitude. You know, I found that when I lose my gratitude, I lose everything. When I lose my gratitude, I question everything. When I lose my credit, I was like, am I meant to be a disciple? And I look at all of the, the, the hard things involved in the discipleship. I'm like, this is difficult. Why is it so hard to wake up in the morning? Man, I'm, I'm meant to pray for an hour? I don't even know what to say. When you're ungrateful. When you're grateful, there's so much to say. Because your eyes are focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. It is warming up. In Hebrews 12. You guys mind if I blow my nose?
In Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorn and shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, he endured such opposition from sinful men, to not grow weary and lose heart. This is my final scripture for you guys. We're called to fix our eyes on him. Now, this is a very profound principle I'm about to teach you. It says we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. It describes he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And it says that there was joy that was set before him. There's nothing about the crucifixion that was joyful. And yet he was able to find joy in it. What was the joy? It was you. The fruit of the, he looked past the pain. He was looking at, at, at Michaela's face when she came out of the waters of baptism. He was looking at Chris and Reddish when they shared their first kiss at, at the Yota. He's looking at when we're going to be at Barcelona, we're going to send out those free churches. He's looking at the fruit of the miracles of what he is doing. And the Bible says he sat on the right hand of God. Then it goes to say, verse 3, consider him. If, I, if there's any point of discipleship I think people are, are neglected, is this. The Bible says when we consider him, we will not grow weary and lose heart. Ever been weary before? Now what's weary? It means tired. It means you don't want to do the same thing again. Ever lost heart before? This means you're discouraged. Discouraged. Like there's nothing anyone can say that's going to fire you up. This despondent. The Bible says that these two places are where we land when we don't remember Jesus. If you take a moment, close your eyes. Close your eyes. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's 24 hours before Jesus is about to die. He comes in with these guys. All of his disciples are messing about high five each other, joking. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the three close, and he takes him a little bit further along. Then he visibly begins to be sorrowful. And he tells him, guys, pray with me. My heart is heavy. I'm overwhelmed with what God's calling me to do. So much so I want to die in this moment. Please pray. And then he goes, goes a little bit further. He falls with his face to the ground and he he prays with a deep earnestness and angst in his heart. God, take this cup away, please. Please, God. And he prays like this for another 45 minutes and he ends his prayer with this phrase. But not my will, but yours be done. He comes back and he, he sees his, his disciples and they're all asleep on him. He wakes them up and says, guys, Pray. It's going to help you overcome your sinful nature. If you don't want to fall into temptation, you've got to give your heart to prayer. And he goes through, he prays again. It's the same prayer. This time he prays even more earnestly. And he, he has sweats of blood coming down his face. He comes back the third time and his disciples don't notice the sweat, but they're asleep. And he goes and he prays again. By the third time, he sees Judas coming in the distance. He wakes these guys up and says, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Judas comes running to him, kisses him with joy and says, Rabbi, I've missed you. And Jesus tells him to his face, looks him in his eye. He says, my friend, my good friend, do what you came for. The Bible says, Peter takes a sword and he cuts off the servants of the high priest's air, not aiming for his air, but for his head. The Bible says, Jesus heals the servants of the high priest. And rebukes Peter for trying to take his life. Jesus says, if I really wanted to fight, I could fight. But I'm surrendered right now. All of the disciples flee from him. Jesus looks at each and every one of them. With sorrow in his heart. And he's left alone with the enemy. Jesus goes to an illegal trial of the 
Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're looking for false evidence to kill him. But Jesus lived such a righteous life, they could not find anything. The high priest gets fed up and says, tell me now, are you the son of God? Jesus says, it is as you say. You're going to see me come in the glory of the heavenly angels and God, and I'm going to judge this world. They spit on him, they slap him, they pull out his hair. They ridicule him, say, hey, prophesy, who hit you? And Jesus gets beaten up by these religious people. They take him to Pilate. Pilate wants to free him. They pit him against the most notorious criminal he has, Barabbas. And he's thinking, of course they're going to let this guy go. But instead they call for Jesus to be crucified. Pilate wanted to please the people who had the moment. And the Bible says Jesus gets so severely whipped and beaten to an inch of his life. And they take him, strip him of his clothes. The soldiers spit on him, whack him on the head. The Bible says they put his clothes back on and he starts his journey on the Villa de la Rosa. The weight of the cross is a bit too much and he falls. Simon the Cyrene is forced to carry the cross at that moment of inconvenience for Cyrene. Simon the Cyrene becomes a moment of salvation for him and his family. Jesus picks up his cross, he gets nails on it. And while he's dying on the cross, he prays for those who are the source of his pain for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they did. The Bible says the thieves are hurling insults at him. But then the Bible says one of the thief repents and cries out to the other thief, don't you fear God? We're getting what our sins deserve, but this man is not. And he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember when you entered your kingdom, Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise today. Jesus saves this guy. The darkness covers the entire life from 12 to 3 p.m. A physical foreshadow of what's going on spiritually. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because he's questioning God, but because he's looking at the scriptures and thinking, what, what scripture best describes how I'm feeling right now? And he quotes Psalms 22 verse 1, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible says he gives up his spirit and the temple and the curtain is caught, torn into two from top to bottom. The rock split, people resurrect from the dead. It is at that point that the centurion says, surely this is the Son of God. Open your eyes. When you think about what Jesus went through, you meditate on that. You can't tell me that does not give you perspective. To look at your own life and say, what I'm going through is nothing. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Let me, let me, get, let, let me pull my socks up. Let me, let me just get stuff going. The issue in our discipleship is that we think too much of ourselves. And we don't think enough about what Jesus went through. The communion you take every Sunday should be something you should do every, every day. So I've got a simple challenge. Meditate on the cross every, every time you pray. Every quiet time. Meditate what Jesus went through. Think about it. Consider it. Think about different ways to look at it. Find different scriptures in the Bible that speak about it. Memorize it. Have it on your heart. Because the more we remember Jesus and what he went through, the more God's going to do through you. Because you're going to do things for him. Have you forgotten God? Don't lie about it. Be honest. What's your, what does your life say? Shared your faith this week? Been to many studies this week? Gone after God like never before this week? Let this week be a week where we remember God in our lives. And we display him like never before. I love you to God be the glory.
Thank you.